Okay, so today I'm going to talk about some work that we've been doing with the DTS to kind of get a, a, a different perspective on an oceanographic uh, process, um, internal waves. So um, there are internal waves in many different uh, fluids, but for those who haven't spent much time thinking about them, uh, internal waves are gravity waves propagating along density interfaces or within uh, a stratified fluid. Um, and we are, my group is looking at internal waves in the ocean and in particular sort of the end of life of internal waves in the near shore coastal ocean uh, and have found the uh, DTS to be an extremely useful instrument in um, getting a continuous spatial uh, measurement of internal wave dynamics. And so I'm gonna talk today about, show some work uh, from two different field experiments that we did, one in 2014 and one in 2019 on an atoll that is in the middle of the South China Sea. Uh, and the South China Sea is just known for having really big internal waves. Um, these waves are of amplitude of uh, greater than 100 meters. And so they are, um, have a vertical length scale of 100 to 200 meters in height. Uh, and so they are really big waves and they drive some strong flows and affect uh, nearshore ecosystems because they tend to drive a lot of upwelling. So this is a picture of a, uh, of a Taiwanese fishing vessel. It's a kind of a large craft and there's lots of people on board. Here I am and some students. Here's a reel of cable and we're essentially deploying, this is in 2000, last summer, uh, or uh, summer of 2019, I guess two summers ago now. We're deploying this cable from where the DTS unit sits on this scaffolding uh, unit that's been built on a shallow sandy spot on this reef flat over a three kilometer wide uh, reef flat out to the open ocean uh, and down the slope where these internal waves are approaching from. The idea is to be able to look at the cross shore uh, temperature signal near the bed and learn something about these internal waves. The work that I'm gonna show you today is a, um, uh, is certainly a, a group effort of uh, some of my students and postdocs, and we have benefited greatly from the assistance of, of several uh, people at CTEMPS, um, Scott and John, Kara and Chris, and certainly um, people from Selitza, uh, Thomas Coleman and others. So this is, um, I'm excited to be talking to all of you guys again. So really, um, the questions that we were after in this spot are to understand um, how internal waves are shaping the physical and chemical environment on the reef. This is a sort of large map of the South China Sea and then zooming in on this um, atoll here, this very pleasingly round atoll. Um, this is a sea surface uh, or this is a, a satellite image that is really able to uh, kind of image some of these waves as so they're approaching from the right side of the screen as they're approaching the uh, atoll from the east propagating west. And here you can see these waves sort of refracting around the atoll. Um, and uh, the reason that we are interested in the, our kind of motivation for understanding uh, waves in this region, especially is that they can influence the near shore environment. Uh, and here that means uh, the coral reef and kind of set the ocean temperature and uh, upwell a lot of nutrients that are uh, important for uh, the coral reef. So um, here's an example of some moorings that we had out in 2019. We were working with some Taiwanese uh, collaborators who were able to put in some deep ocean moorings to pair up with our shallow ocean moorings to be able to look at these beasts uh, these waves as they propagate offshore. And here's an example of uh, the density profile for one of these waves. So this is in 500 meters of water and you can see one of these soliton-like waves uh, come through this wave of depression that's um, really affecting the water column uh, over 400 of the 500 meters of the, of the water column. As they shoal into shallow water, just like as big waves uh, that we see in the beach, 
shoal onto into shallow um, into onto the beach, they are breaking and becoming these turbulent, uh, highly nonlinear, messy uh, 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 bores. And the same thing happens to these internal waves. So we were really after understanding some of those messy nonlinear dynamics in the near shore here. Um, this wave uh, on the right hand side of this 500 meter plot was actually uh, the same one that's captured in the satellite image refracting around the atoll while we were out there and had our, our instruments in the water. So. Um, and then again, uh, th why do we, why are we at Dongsha measuring these internal waves? This is a, um, a compilation of about 15 years of uh, sea surface temperature at, um, uh, at Dongsha Atoll in, uh, in the summer months and shows this persistent cooling crescent on the right hand side of the um, the atoll and really kind of emphasizes that these are upwelling cold water onto the reef. So our setup, we had a lot of instruments at it, but I'm gonna focus on the uh, DTS cable that we had, which is that yellow line on the East Four Reef. So I told you it's kind of going over the, uh, uh, the reef flat and then down the Four Reef slope. We had our uh, DTS sitting on the scaffolding, as well as you can see the tip of a wind turbine and some solar panels that were powering this system to a bank of marine batteries, because um, we didn't have a plug out there. And uh, the cable runs uh, three kilometers across the reef, and then uh, in this case, a, a kilometer um, uh, offshore down to about uh, 50 meters. Uh, and uh, here is this cable on the reef. You can see it's kind of going along the bottom of the reef and in a cross shore profile past a mooring, a vertical mooring that we had on the, at about 20 meters depth. Okay, so here's some, here's some data from uh, a, a kind of a sample of uh, data from this. So we are taking a trace of temperature down the, the uh, past the reef crest. And I'm just showing the sort of offshore section of the, the um, cable here. So from the reef crest down uh, the four reef slope down to about 50 meters. And this is about six hours of time. And so we're taking a trace every 30 seconds uh, in this image. And what we can see here are these really strong temperature gradients, which correspond to this um, bottom propagating broken internal wave, this uh, wave that's propagating up the slope, bringing with it very cold water uh, that's high in nutrients. And what you can see from these, uh, this image here is that this is essentially an internal uh, swash zone. Uh, uh, it is just like what we would imagine you might see on the beach if the wave is coming up and then coming back down again, you know, draining back down into the ocean. You see the same thing as these bores are, these cold bores are, are rushing up onto the shallow uh, reef slope here. And uh, we can confirm the shape of these in the vertical with some of our other moorings on, um, on the shelf there, but I won't get into the, uh, the waves, the, the dynamics of these waves. Uh, if you are interested, we have a paper in uh, JGR uh, this year that um, goes into detail on these. Uh, we can also use this uh, DTS cable on the reef flat itself. So zero is the reef crest, above that is offshore, and everything here is actually on the reef flat to look at temperature variability on this reef flat and to look at how these internal waves are actually pushing cool water up onto the reef flat, changing not only the temperature, but the pH and the um, nutrients on the reef flat. One and if you're interested in, thanks, Kara. If you're interested in learning more about that, uh, my student Emma has a nice paper in uh, limnology and oceanography, so you're welcome to check out. But it turns out that the internal waves can um, actually change the temperature on the reef by up to two degrees and uh, deliver um, you know, up to four times as much uh, nitrate to the reef as would otherwise uh, happen just from surface water offshore. And the DTS has kind of really helped us to kind of map that uh, that mass of water as it's getting transported across the reef. Um, I'd also like to bring your attention to a, a, a new paper that uh, a postdoc of mine, Greg Sinnott, has published from a study that we did off of the Scripps Pier uh, about a year ago. And it was really intended to kind of sort out some of our methodological um, uh, uh, 
approaches before we took the, cable, the DTS to uh, the South China Sea again. Uh, we put uh, a couple of different type, types of cable, uh, an armored cable, the flat black uh, drop cable and um, kind of a tactical really thin cable and deployed them together off of the Scripps Pier uh, in some different conditions and looked at um, really trying to, you know, uh, write about some different deployment techniques that are relevant to uh, oceanographic applications, uh, addressing some calibration challenges that are encountered at least by us <laughs> due to difficult deployment scenarios, and then some strategies for data processing. And then this is just an example of a plot that I like from that paper, which shows some of the um, uh, consequences in uh, root mean square error of different approaches for temporal averaging and spatial averaging of uh, DTS data. Are you ready to wrap up, Kristen? Yeah, and so really, um, I you guys can uh, read this slide. I can be done. <laughs>